Hey, welcome to Atheist Edge. I'm Chris, and I'm here with Dr. Travis Dickinson, who is a associate professor of uh, philosophy and Christian apologetics at Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. And he's also the author of the book, Stand Firm, which we are about to uh, get into at our book club tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Dickinson, thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure to be here, for sure. So you just a lot of uh, atheist arguments in the book, and even when we're talking amongst each other, we recognize that some arguments are not as good as others, and uh, so we try and filter out the worst ones mm -hmm. and let the more solid ones rise to the top. And I'm sure, in your opinion, there's probably none that are uh, like perfectly uh, stated or um, convincing, or otherwise you may be an atheist. But um, are there any arguments that when you're doing your classes that you would recommend to your students as uh, things that you would really recommend that Christians of all uh, apologetic skill levels or evangelical levels really uh, be prepared to address? Yeah, so arguments from the atheist perspective. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, Yeah. I, I always do a section on the problem of evil, mm -hmm. of course, because I think that's one where we should never really stop thinking about that, reflecting on that, because that one really, in, in many ways, hits us in the gut, mm -hmm. because uh, especially when it comes to the, the inevitable when evil or, or pain and suffering touches one's own life, so I always recommend uh, students, if they've thought about it before or never thought about it, to let this one beat them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. let them wrestle with this one. Don't be too quick uh, to sort of just solve it, especially because solving it, what does that even mean? You might have an intellectual answer that just sort of covers uh, your, your curiosity or something uh, to your satisfaction, but this, this has a way of coming back up in mm -hmm. different ways. And so I think that's one that can hit people in a lot of different ways. We talk about the emotional problem of evil, intellectual problem of evil, those sorts of things. And I think you can get to it at a very sophisticated level. I mean, uh, very technical books have been written about the problem of evil, but it's also one that my kids raise from time to time and can think about in various ways. Yeah, and you've been in a chapter of your book uh, addressing this issue, yeah. and uh, it's fun. I mean, we've been at this book club for a couple of years now, and it is a subject that comes yeah. up uh, pretty regularly. It yeah, and it's definitely you're right. It's very emotional yeah. for people because we've all lost someone or yeah. dealt with suffering yeah. or whatnot. So who knows? Maybe we'll get into it tonight yeah. a little bit. We'll see how it yeah. goes. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a pause here and come back a little later with another question. Welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club, a monthly gathering of believers and skeptics who respectfully discuss books from both perspectives. My name is James Walker. I'm the president of Watchman Fellowship, a Christian, evangelical Christian, um, apologetics ministry defending the Christian faith, specializing mostly in interfaith evangelism. I'm also the co-founder here of the Atheist and Christian Book Club. I'm the Christian half. Um, we've got, I'll introduce Bill in a second, our other co-founder, uh, Bill Cluck, who's uh, the atheist half of the equation. Uh, we have uh, quite a few new people here this time. We're also streaming on Facebook Live. Uh, before we get to the, I'm really excited about uh, this month's book, and uh, we have the author here with us. But before we get to that, I just want to take a minute to uh, talk to you about some things that are coming up. Um, uh, our group is going to Utah uh, next week and uh, for a uh, week-long mission trip. And with everything going on, I'm going to say, uh, we, I talked to Bill, we're going to have no book club on July. So July 5th is the 4th of July weekend, and I'm, I'm sure you have some things to do besides reading a book and doing homework for that. So no book club. Then we're going to come back with something very special. We're going to have another author with us, and this is going to be on the August uh, 2nd uh, book club. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Stephanie F. Chase, the author of the book, Pulling Back the <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, it's very rare to get Dr. Chase. I gave him approval for that. <laughs> now, this book talks about 666, this is written from a atheist perspective, 666 things that uh, your clergy, your your minister, your rabbi, your imam did not tell you. And uh, because it's t discussing also critically Islam and the Quran and Muhammad, uh, this is a uh, pseudonym. So the 
You might see the resemblance with, uh, with the twin brother. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Jim Hall, who's a member of the club, a charter member of the Atheist and Christian Book Club. He's also an author himself. Ken Daniels is another one. We did his book. Uh, several of us are authors as well as being members of the club. And so uh, Pulling Back the Green Curtain is going to be our, um, our book. So I've got... Bill, I'm going to you to pop this off and pass that around. We've got the thing to put on your refrigerator to help you remember that. And um, so, Jim, did you want to say anything about the book? Um, I've got five copies, five copies at the house that I brought from the house. So okay. I'm just going to give those to pre preferably students that maybe are a little kind of hard up for money. So I, I got five copies available if you're a student or you would just like a free copy. I got so those available. If you're a poor student or just poor, there you go. either one. There you go. It's <laughs> also available as a Kindle book. Kindle's like four bucks. I think it showed up as free. It, there's a free Kindle. if you're an Amazon Prime or okay, that's that, why it was yeah. Um, uh, Prime what I okay, so but just like James said, it's 666 things. You can pick up the book. It's a bathroom reader. You can pick up the book. You can open it up to any spot in the book and just start reading. Um, what I would ask though. For, for August, there's going to be some inaccuracies in here. You're going to get me on a lot of stuff. I, I've got myself on a lot of stuff since then, since I've written it. Um, but in addition to that, try to find the strong arguments that you think I'm making as well. So look, look for both. So there's 616 now because of the translation. Of Number 616 in the book talks about that Hebrew mistranslation. So it's kind of funny. All right. <clears throat> okay. All right, so we got that, and uh, then the following month would be Jim Hall, and we're going to do his book on the pulling back the green curtain, and then uh, after that we're going to come back with something very, very special we've never done before. September 6th, we're going to have two authors in the same room, the atheist and the Christian author. We're going to have uh, John Loftus, we're flying him down just for the book club, uh, and he'll be joining uh, Travis Dickinson, uh, who is uh, author of Stan Firm, our author this, e this evening as well. And we're going to revisit these last two books, The, the Christian Delusion. Uh, we're going to maybe add another chapter or two, revisit that, come back. We've had time to think about it. We've already had some good discussions. These will be discussions with the authors, uh, both authors present. <coughs> I've talked to Travis about maybe it would be nice to have the authors ask each other questions maybe have a little uh, section sure. on that as well so not a not a formal debate per se but i'm really excited about what we have for august and september in the book club but this evening we're going to be talking about the book stand firm and so i'll be our first look at that uh and uh travis is one of the co-authors of that book and i'm like uh, my counterpart uh, bill cluck uh, our co-founder to tell you a little bit about our yeah we're really pleased to have Dr. Travis Dickinson here. Um, he's an associate professor of philosophy and Christian apologetics at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also holds a BA in education from Alaska Bible College. He's got an MA from Biola, from uh, Talbot. Uh, you've been all around, haven't you? I mean that's fantastic. Studied under Wing Wayne Craig, right? And a PhD from the University of Iowa. Uh, in addition to co-authoring Stan Firm, uh, Paul Gould, and Keith Lofton, he has written Everyday Apologetics and numerous articles for the Christian Research Journal. So nice to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, I actually enjoyed the book. I like that your part on David Hume. I like your illustrations. They were very clear, very, you know, you know concise. But the best thing was what you call the epistemic peer thing. So I dated a girl in Austin. We went out to dinner. So I got the check. It was like $360. So I'm going, well, how do you think it went? She goes, well, to be honest with you, I found you very shallow. I went, well, thanks. Very insightful. Uh, so uh, she was a lawyer, so she was pulling the lawyer card on me and so forth. So then I said, um, you know, later when we were talking, I said, do you think I'm your epistemic peer? And she goes, wow, where did you get that? So, <laughs> anyway. But um, it's like, and I've been using it all around our theology meetups. <laughs> <laughs> Are you girls my epistemic peers? So I've just been, I just love that. So, uh, but anyway, you said that uh, we are really not Christians' epistemic peers because they have the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So my thing is, you got someone like Chris here who has spent his life, you know, 
doing this sort of thing. He worked in a Christian bookstore for six years. He's on the Atheist Edge. He just reads books all the time. Doesn't he get credit for being, you know, an epistemic peer of a Christian who has never done the work he's done? Oh, sure, sure. So I wasn't trying to say if we're Christians, then we're up here and the atheists and everybody else are sort of down here in terms of their, their peer groups. Uh, what I was actually trying to say is that none of us are true and genuine peers in the following sense. So maybe backing up a little bit just to define some of these terms, um, an epistemic peer would be someone who, in terms of what they know, uh, what they rationally believe, their experiences, um, all the background that sort of comes in, figures into us forming our beliefs and that sort of a thing, an epistemic peer would be someone who's looked at all the same evidence, had all the same background, had all the same, you know, and then they're they're disagreeing, and this sets up a lot of the literature on uh, epistemic disagreement, which, which is a big area in epistemology. And so my point was to say, <clears throat> I'm not sure that any of us in this room are genuine epistemic peers, because do any of us have the exact same background that figures into our belief formation? No, of course not, right? And n none of us, the arguments to me, as, as I've spent about uh, 20 years now, really digging into the apologetic arguments and philosophical arguments and so forth, uh, there are so many subtleties, there are so many nuances, and, and, and they matter for how the arguments you know, sort of impact us and, and figure into our, our beliefs and so, so forth. So with, with that, we could be looking at the same argument but still, still not be a genuine peer because we, we're not sort of appreciating the, the But you are saying that you got special insight being a Christian, so, special revelation. Yeah, yeah. It, go ahead. So I was just going to say, the last piece there is, so uh, it, if it's right to say that... Um, so if you take two people, one person who is a Christian and one who's an atheist, let's say, and the Christian has had this genuine, you know, hypothetically genuine experience of God, and the atheist hasn't, but they're looking at, the, say, the same arguments or something, I say they, those aren't necessarily epistemic peers because that religious experience figures into the Christian. Okay, well, how about someone like Ken Daniels, yeah. who was a missionary to Africa, yeah. like, that did have a, when was yours, five years old? Ken or four? Oh, four, excuse me. <laughs> so, that, did he not have the Holy Spirit? Does he not have an edge? No, he might. He might. I'm just saying our experiences matter, and I think that I, I want to make room for uh, a, a Christian's um, epistemic position to include their, their real experiences, assuming they're real, of God. And those should figure in, which differentiates somebody who hasn't. Now, if Ken has had real experiences of God, uh, I, of course, can't say for sure. Uh, but if he has, then, yeah, that should figure into his epistemology as well. And it might put him in a... In a and again, I'm not trying to say, like, that puts the Christian up here that's had right, the experience. Right, you know, right. I'm not trying to, like, do a uh, sort of spitting contest here. Rather, I'm saying... No, I, mean, I think yeah. we all have this really sure, uh, complicated and nuanced backgrounds that figure into so that, of course, we're going to come to different beliefs, even though, in a sort of superficial sense, we're looking at the same arguments. Did, who had a question? We got questions already. I do. Hi. Thank you yeah. uh, for taking my question. Yeah. I, I, I'm cons so I, I, I get your your position. The, the nuance is, is understandable. Okay. Uh, we don't all have the same training. We don't all have the same background. We don't all have the same experiences. I, I call myself a former Christian. Okay. There was a time in my life where I believed deeply and devoutly that I did, in fact, have uh, a, a direct experience with God and Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I, I came to find somewhat later that I, re I really was, was treating my own claim differently than I would treat claims from other religions, and that I was guilty of the special pleading fallacy. Okay. How would you respond to someone who says, but I used to be a Christian, and at the time I believed that I did in fact have this direct revelation, what, are you, are you indirectly saying that I was never really a Christian? No, no, that's a, I'm not trying I, to say that And I don't mean anybody. to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I, yeah, no, and I'm not trying to say that for anybody. So my, my <coughs> only point is the first point that you said, and then also just try to create some space for religious experience, <coughs> an experience of God. Now, 
let's say you had a genuine, real experience of God. I don't know. I mean, so is your is your view now that that was not a real experience of God? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, at the time you believed it was, you had some experiences of some sort and you believed it was, that's all I'm really saying is that figured into the sort of epistemology sure, of sure, your beliefs. Sure. Now that was overwhelmed by other arguments that you came in touch with and so on. And and so you're, you have this rich and varied background that you bring to the table when you and I discuss um, differently from an atheist who's never, would say, now I've never even felt a, a little, uh, you know, whisper of, right, right. of God or whatever. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not discounting anybody's experience or anything like that. I'm just, and it might sound that way. And I apologize if it does. I'm, I'm only saying that I want to create some space for that. But the bigger point of the epistemic peer is to say, mm -hmm. of course we're going to have. If we have 28 people in the room. I think we're going to have 28 different views and disagree about that. And that alone isn't uh, an objection to uh, Christian belief, for example. And uh, that's the objection I was confronting. We had a Christian. Can I ask this uh, gentleman a question? Sure, I, I, just more background on what you're saying. Sure, sure. Do you now believe that the experience you had was false and you have an explanation for it? Or did you just have so many other things cause you to lose faith that you go, well, I, that must have been... I must have been dreaming or something. I mean, how, how do you discount it if it was real at the time? I, I don't think either of the two uh, okay. postulated scenarios are mutually exclusive. Okay. Um, I, after considerably deeper thought, I decided that my treatment of my own experiences uh, w was really nothing more than special pleading. I was, I was saying that mine were real and others weren't. Or maybe confirmation bias. Confirmation that bias. You got all this... <laughs> We don't right. realize we have this the infrastructure of radio, TV, seven, we've got seven seminaries of this. I mean, we're in the right. epicenter right here in <laughs> the, Dow, the Metroplex. Right. You know, and we don't even, when I was 17, born again, I didn't know what hit me. Because I had friends. Right. I, Thank you, sir. You know, you're, you're welcome. It's just, you know, we have this culture we're in. And uh, John Loftus, who's going to be here, mm -hmm. the right the Christian delusion we're going to be studying, it says that we're swimming in a Christian culture, so we don't even know. And it's it's really true, right? I, as young people, uh, very frequently I find that you know children aren't really given the opportunity to objectively reach a conclusion before the age of reason. Uh, pardon the, the pun, Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. But before <laughs> before the age of reason, their 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 minds are. And forgive me, I, that they're. Um, I'm looking for a, a, a an appropriate verb. Their minds are programmed. Uh, they are taught, they are trained, and at a young age, you're, you, it, it's part of, it's a, well, it's, it's a construct of biology. You're right? obviously never been on Instagram. <laughs> maybe, maybe so. <laughs> but, but children uh, are, are programmed by biology children, to, to accept the, the, right. the things that they're taught from their But you've got the most skeptical people in the world. Who was that? Michael Shermer, who was at uh, your seminary. He became a Christian. He was a, he was a guest at the seminary. He wasn't like one yeah. of the professors. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just wanted to declare it. Yeah, in Barham, and for some, and me, at 17, that's when I think we're just finding ourselves yeah. out or whatever, and just we're susceptible to the pro Christian propaganda. And it, it hit, I mean, look at Mike Barb Herman, who was going to be the next C.S. Lewis. Uh, who, I mean, these guys are not just your typical Christians. These are. A plus Christians that just like Dan Barker, right. he was debating Justin Bass at the Bible and Beer Consortium, mm -hmm. and I asked him. I said, "Was Dan Barker ever a Christian?" And he said, "Dan Barker." And uh, Justin says, "No, probably not." And he goes, "If anybody was, I was more of a Christian than you were." He says. So he goes, "If anybody was a Christian, I was," because he went to Mexico witnessing the Catholics, right. which, if you're a true Christian, you know are not Christian, real Christians. You know. So like, how how deep was he in that? I mean, what do you think about So it? may I ask there. the yeah. measurement of Christianity is whether you do stuff? No, it's whether you're like a Calvinist or not, if you reach the highest level. <laughs> 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 I'm going to bring a lot of questions, but I want to kind of get some foundational stuff that I hope will lay one. some foundation for what we want to talk about a little bit more. One of the first, I think it was the first chapter that we were really trying to focus on. There was an interesting section, which has come up here in the book club maybe at least twice over the last two and a half years we've been doing this. What do we mean when we say when we say faith? And is, does faith mean that there is no evidence whatsoever? And once you have one scrap of evidence, we're not dealing in the realm of faith anymore. 
And you have a good section on that, and we you talk about fideism and kind of the differences and different kind of Christian perspectives. Yeah. Could you talk about that a little bit and just remind yeah. us of that chapter? Yeah, absolutely. So um, and this is something that's really important to me, and I've actually just written a, a um, article for a journal on this exact topic. Um, so faith for me, and, and, and when I say for me, just my view about it, and I would say this is true of even those feedings. Okay, so I'm going to try to pull that off here. Um, is that faith shouldn't be understood in epistemological terms. So it shouldn't be understood in terms of belief, of evidence, justification, etc. I want to say that faith should be in moral terms. Faith itself. Now, I'm not saying epistemology and, and belief and evidence things don't figure into it. It certainly does. But my view of faith is that faith is trust, is a certain kind of trust. And trust is not epistemology. Right? It's not epistemic. Uh, faith is, a, is a, an action. It's an, it's, there's an act of trust. And so let me just sp sort of spell that out. As, as I, I know people are probably ready to jump in, but um, I am entrusting myself to my chair currently. And so are most of you. Um, and that is a, it, I mean, it's not much faith, we might say, but right, it is an act that we have committed ourselves to. Um, and that's a good example of faith. We're entrusting ourselves. Um, if I give a definition, it'd be something like, ventured trust, where we, we do take something of a leap, but again, it's not an epistemic leap, it's a, it's a leap in sort of risking ourselves with others, um, risking ourselves with, with things. So I think a really great example, actually, is getting on an airplane. Uh, I talk about this a lot. Uh, there's probably nothing crazier than we, that we do than getting on an airplane. If you really stop to think about how crazy it is that we get onto a metal craft metal, right, heavy, you know, thing, uh, and, and we, we sit into a chair, strap ourselves in, and we go down a little road, and before we know it, we're six miles off the planet. Um, it's crazy, and, and if things go wrong, we're dead. I mean, it's just, right, it goes badly. So I think that's a pretty beautiful picture of faith, because we literally entrust ourselves, we venture ourselves, we risk ourselves on an airplane. <coughs> Okay, so now if that's what faith is, kind of that's faith, now we think about the epistemology. You can put your faith in things that you have no good reason for placing your faith in that thing. So if you get on a rusty, uh, you know, old, uh, you know, fluids are leaking out of an airplane, that's probably not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. But could we? Absolutely. Right? Could we, could we entrust ourselves to a, a, a rickety chair? We could. Um, but the, the idea is, what I want to say, there's faith and then there's virtuous faith. And the way I think of virtuous faith is faith when we have good reason to, um, to trust the thing that we place our faith in. And that's where all the epistemology comes in. So I, I want to say, I place my faith in Christ in the following sense, that I think I've got good reasons to believe uh, the claims of Christ and the claims of the Bible and the, uh, the, the claims of Christianity. I've got reasons, and we, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, and, and we talk about in the book, and hopefully we can talk more about that. I've got good reasons, but I've entrusted myself, that's the faith, and so I, I think of that as a reasonable faith, to borrow Phil Craig's uh, title, um, right? And, and that's where the epistemology figures in. But and, you could, and belief in faith. Could you, could you... Yeah, so I don't think that faith itself is constituted by beliefs. That, we have we have the things that we believe, and then we will make a choice at a certain point of what we place our faith in. Here's my problem with that. Okay. okay. You said in your book, there's three uh, undisputed things. The uh, empty tomb was one, right? Not undisputed. Or, or uh, what was the word? The, you know, sure. uh, minimal Terry facts. Minimal facts. Minimal facts. Minimal facts. Okay. okay, so you got the empty tomb. Bart Ehrman used to believe in that. Now that's questionable. Uh, even John Shelby Spong, who wrote this book, The Fourth Gospel, of which is you know, a great book, he believes, as skeptical as he is, that the disciples had a sudden transformation yeah. which uh, changed their disposition, which, so he believes they did have something happen yeah, to yeah, hit yeah. them. That, but, here's where I you know, have a problem. You actually call the post-mortem appearances of Jesus a fact. Yeah, uh, that 
in the sense that they're appearances, so that there's that that could be hallucinations, that could be uh, delusions of. How about just other. like let's just take an example: yeah. uh, the fish fry at the Sea of Tiberias, <coughs> okay, where Jesus had a fish fry with the disciples. Okay. Well, obviously that was John twenty-one. That that was added later. That was not in the original uh, John. And no, no scholars, but you can read John Joey Spong's book, believes that that is historical, that is fiction. And Mark, what happens at the ending of Mark? The women go and they tell no one else. Where's the post-mortem experiences? There. I mean, you can, and Matthew and Luke were written 15 years later, so you can see the legendary embellishment. You can see the story, oh, like the road to Emmaus, where, uh, like in Rome, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, in uh, Luke's Gospel, all roads lead out of Jerusalem. So it just just screams of fiction that he's just making this stuff up. What do you say to that? Okay, well, to the next is, chapter. Is that, <laughs> how does that connect with what I said about faith? Maybe because you're having your faith in something that isn't true, that was historical fiction. Oh, in that particular piece. So I, I don't want to think of it as I have faith in that story. I believe that story, and I believe that that was original to uh, the original account. But that's 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 the epistemology side of it. I have faith in Christ and faith, right? So for me, it's it's. I think of it this way. So I think having a good analogy is uh, the faith that we place in our say spouses or you know uh, in people. Um, I have good reasons to believe my, that my wife. Uh, is a very is a ultimate and she's back there but uh, <laughs> she's an ultimate uh, object of faith right and I think I do that on the basis of good reasons so if you're calling into question this one piece of reasoning well then we should have a discussion about that and I don't know that I'm ready here tonight to give the the case for the historicity okay. of that <coughs> passage first the but the minute. bigger I point to faith is okay. still okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Very short question. I think you wrote that faith, uh, the, the word faith as translated from the original would be better translated many times as trust. Did I yeah. make that right? Uh, I don't know if I say that in there, but I should have said that in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on page 29 you said we should understand faith as simply a state of trust. Okay, yeah. yeah. But I think you but talked about the translation from the original also. I mean, let's say, yeah. I feel like it's you guys co-opting words and then changing the meanings, though. Because oh, when you okay. say, well, yeah, because when you say faith, I mean, I, I see faith as, as gullibility dressed up as a virtue, and I think that you're saying, tr you're trying to point back to this thing that say, well, we said this before, but people didn't think that that was a good thing, so we're actually, we're going to append this other meaning to it now, and that's what faith is. So I think is, there a, is, which, is there historical precedence yeah. for what you're talking about? Oh, okay. Uh, so... Yeah, these sort of terminological, there's the terminological debate, right? We're just saying, how do we understand the word, the, the term faith? Um, and so, I, I'm not sure if you're making the claim that it's always been understood as a gullible, what did you say? No, that's just my, I mean, that's my, that's just my interpretation and my take on, on what it's, on, you know, other definitions. Of but, but you can go, word. Peter Balcosian, the you know, philosophy uh, guy, uh, you know who he is, uh, uh, said uh, that faith is pretend to believe things you that aren't, you well, know, aren't true. Or you quote, I think you quote Mark Twain that, that yeah. faith is something, we, yeah. we believe something we know ain't so. Yeah. Yeah. Or more to the point, it's uh, people, when people believe things when they don't have a good reason to. Right. Yeah. Or it's if faith hard. is completely because synonymous with you trust and confidence, then what makes the word faith unique? It does it have its own distinctions. No yeah. 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 No. I, so I just want to hear that answer. So, are you saying that's what Christians have believed historically? Is that it's it's belief? No. I, I feel like that's what's he, been Hebrews been, eleven. No, that's, I think that's, that's what's what it been says. done by apologists. Okay. Okay. They've co opted been defended by apologists. No. I, no. I think that's what's been done with the but, word. Okay. By so you're saying it's co opted. So right. You're taking definitions used to be. You're taking definitions from other words and and co-opting them and moving the goalposts and saying no that's what that's that's yeah, no. what we meant when we say I, faith I, but when you're but when you're dealing with any existential claim you necessarily have to view it as a proposition and that is epistemological in its very nature you can't just say oh we, we're not going to take the epistemological approach here you have to defend you have to show the causal link you have to show how you know what you know and ju your justification for what you know and, and knowledge is justified true belief and if it's justified you would show the causal link for the justification, which you can't do. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not following. What, what can't I do? Show a causal <laughs> link between the things that you're saying you have trust in like and your chair analogy. Well, I think, I think you, you, uh, yeah, help me. both sides of it here. 
Um, what he was trying to do is establish a foundation of what we mean when we say I, I faith. Get that. But also in the book, he lays down the historical background of how many centuries this goes back. Now he says always there was a group of there was some Christians today and even historically that have had a, a fideistic understanding. Like I don't have any evidence, but I, I'm kind of a. Right. We choose to believe it anyway, but that's always been a minority yeah. position amongst Christians. But you're an evidential believer. Right? Right? Yeah. So, so it's, he's not saying that no one uses the word faith that way. But here's the but problem. historically, it's not been used that here's way the, exclusively. Then why do we have two separate words then? You, say, you see what I'm saying? Why is there a, why 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 to try to no? There, things well, can be but, but things exist. can be synonymous, but have to have. Okay, let me finish my sentence first. Yeah. So what, things can have synonymous meanings, right, but have distinctions yeah. within the two words, right. then why have one word you, you're saying that means the exact yeah. same things as, as something else? There, there are distinctions no, no, no. In between not, words I, actually, for a reason. I'm saying it's a certain kind of trust. It's a, it's a right. venture trust where we are entrusting ourselves to something. And we actually use the word faith like that all the time. Uh, I think, honestly, I if, I, if I'm being honest, uh, there's many Christians that use it in the silly sort of way yes. to mean belief yes. without evidence. Yes. But then also <clears throat> atheists like Bogosian will come in and say, this is just what the word means without engaging. And I agree yeah, with that. Yeah. 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 I'm aware that words are polysemous. I, I get that. No, I get words are polysemous. Yeah. So, so uh, good discussion. Um, <laughs> but one, one thing that, to bring an analogy into this, okay. uh, sometimes there will be a discussion on the efficacy of prayer. And you know, studies show that, well, they're really, you know, from medical uh, procedures that perhaps there is no uh, real effect of. of yeah, we did studies that wouldn't. Right, and so the, typically the rejoinder will be from the part of the theist that, uh, well, prayer to me is a relationship with God. It's it's it's, you know, relating to God. And so they kind of discount the, the traditional meaning of prayer, which is intercessory. And and you go back into the into the Bible, the New Testament, you see both aspects. You see the relational aspect, but you also see intercessory prayer. And I think the same thing is is true of faith. Uh, that that there are elements uh, in the New Testament that talk about trust, like you're saying, mm -hmm. but there are other elements that do seem to reward uh, a, a venture in belief in terms of, when, for example, when Jesus was was commending Thomas for believing in him after seeing him, but then he went on to commend those who would come later and believe without seeing. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, a way of, of reward. They were even more virtuous than the people who had actually seen. So there is, a, there is a sense in which faith in the New Testament is seen as a virtue. Hebrews 11.1 1 also... Faith as uh, lacking evidence. Well, no, yeah. meaning belief without necessarily having, um, having, having the evidence, having seen for yourself. Yeah. Uh, plus, then, then um, the, the, I don't see the relational aspect of what you're saying in about faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we have there again the, the, the aspect of not seeing, so yeah. believing without seeing. Can, can I, I so I think that there's, two, there's two streams of... Yeah. of and then, mm -hmm. you, maybe you, you have a different understanding than I do on that. I, I think a couple of months ago I talked about this. This came up, Hebrews 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence not seen. I don't think the passage is saying there is no evidence. Mm -hmm. I think it's saying that evidence is not tangible in the sense of, uh, I use the analogy of uh, your boss tells you you get a bonus in December. And you have faith in that, although you don't have, you're not seeing the evidence. It's not in your account. You don't, you're not holding the check. But, but, the, the, but you have other things to go on that, gives you, that makes your faith reasonable. It is commending you for taking that leap and, and, and going beyond what maybe the evidence is. I don't think it goes beyond. I think it, so I think that the analogy I like to use is, again, with marriage. You know, so with my wife, when we, when we got married, I think I had really good reasons to entrust myself to her and join our finances and do all the things. Right, know, and I see both, come together. both of those. But I customers. don't know how it's going to be 15 years later. Well, now it's right. 15 years later. And it's gone, you know, I, I couldn't do life without her in any sense. Um, now, and so it's gone very well. So it looks like that was a very rational, I mean, it was rational even if it had gone badly because I had good reasons to believe that. But that's an assurance of things hoped for. Um, the evidence wasn't day, seen at the time, but now it, it is. It was unseen. Well, right, but you how that would all be. Seriously, that evidence is your mate based on zero evidence of what their character was going to be. 
I'm sorry? I, I sincerely, sincerely doubt that you chose a partner in life to live your, the rest of your life with without any evidence as to what their character that's was. That's what I said. I said I, I had good reasons to right. trust no, her. Got, exactly. Think, oh, because she but, is this. But she's a person you can say you're talking about. Let's, about, right? let's so. talk yeah, you're, you're about, about the evidence. evidence. <laughs> Wait, let's talk about something about evidence? Because uh, this is discussion we're having in English. If we're having it in Quechua, there's a little, ca as a linguist, I'll just report this, because there's different categories called evidentials, little suffixes that say, this is how I know something happened and how much evidence we have for it. So it says, I, uh, this guy played soccer. Level one, I saw him play. Level two, a different suffix, I heard him play. Level three, I saw his footprints there, which are very distinctive. Level four is, it's reasonable to suppose that. And it's built into the language there. And so, you know, there's Something we, we say evidence, and we're not really quite sure about what level evidence we're talking about. We're throwing around one thing like it's just all the thing, and it's uh, it could be a little bit more deep than that. But and my you know, contention what, is a lot, one more thing. I said there are no true synonyms in English. Not exactly because you cannot use every uh, you pick a pair of words. You can't use them interchangeably in every single context. So they're near synonyms for sure. Yeah, and but, but let me just add to that because uh, that, that's. Uh, there, uh, and I forget who brought this up, but yeah. uh, there's a difference between meaning and reference. So when we speak of the morning star or the evening star, you know, we're speaking of the star, but but th that has the same reference in, in what in what we're trying to get yeah. to. When we speak of faith, it's one of the words that has a different reference depending on how you're using that in, in a construct. And what he was doing by trying to bring out the point that he's establishing it as a venture trust. He's making a, a, a distinction so that we can come to grips with what that aspect, what that reference of the word faith is. And that's a valid, rational thing to do. Well, let me give you an example. Let's just talk concrete here. And you mentioned this in one of your talks. The women coming to the tomb. We have, it's all over the place. In John, you have Mary Magdalene alone going to the tomb. And Luke, you have a slew of women, including Salome and so forth. In Mark, you got Joanna. You have, you, they can't even agree on the day Jesus, uh, you know, was crucified. Uh, John has him the day before uh, Easter, uh, you know, Mark is later. The time, you have one at 9 o'clock, one at 3 o'clock. The Gospels, which you think are great evidence, right, and consistent, to me they're inconsistent, they're not contemporary, and they're, and they're written by biased people that are disinterested. Don't you think so? <laughs> <laughs> Bill, you need some new material. <laughs> Uh, I got the uh, expert here, so I'm let's, gonna, uh, let's do this for a second. We we kind of switch gears completely. Yep. That is a chapter that we are talking about as well. But I, I don't know that we and maybe we've talked as much as we need to about kind of establishing. I do want to talk about the evidence and things, but I wanted to try to get. So this has come up several times in book club before. What do we mean? It's, it, it, I don't. I had never in my mind meant faith to me meant. There was no evidence, and I knew it wasn't true, but I decided to believe it anyway. And that's not, I don't know if I don't any know. Christians well, that have I mean, I don't think I heard anything being addressed about my point of Jesus commending those who would come yeah, later and, and believe without and, seeing. But he, he didn't use the word that, faith. He, he said he did, knew it wasn't true, but they decided Well, to no, he didn't use the word faith. He was just making a virtue out of, uh, you know, the people who who had less evidence to go on less were more virtuous than right. those who had the more evidence. So no, words, I have no problem with the way it's saying that way. The, the, those had less yeah. evidence but trusted Like anybody. somehow right, yeah. Thomas had lost mm -hmm. a little faith the minute he stuck his fingers in that wound. Had lost That's the way. Yeah, because that he had lost faith. Because he, he didn't need faith anymore because he <laughs> felt it. You're, you're somehow a definition you of faith there, though. Well, that's how Jesus how faith shrivels up when you have evidence. Well, I mean, you can take the word faith out of the whole discussion. I just want to know... Is there a commendation for believing with less evidence than believing with more evidence? So I, I think, again, these relational terms. And, and again, not everybody's going to like that. But when I think of my own kids, for example, and I've asked them to do something that's maybe challenging or whatever, and they demand to know reasons why and this and that and the other, um, whereas if I've asked you know, my, my kid to do something and they trust me, you know, and don't need these sort of precautions and questioning and that, that sort of thing. I do think there's a there's a, a virtue to that because they have already come to that place of reasonable faith. Would be my own position. Now, I trust. So they don't need to second guess all along the way. And I do think that's what Thomas. Thomas is somebody who saw the miracles of Christ, if the accounts are true. So he had 
a plenty of evidence to to trust, and he had his best friends uh, and and compatriots that were part of the whole thing saying this is what happened, and yet he demanded sort of more, wanted to see it for himself. So I don't think that's a that's Jesus celebrating the virtue of uh, irrational belief or something like that. That's not quite what I was saying. Okay. I was saying there there is an aspect of of making a virtue out of <coughs> believing even if one doesn't have quite as much evidence as one Let might hope for. Let me address that. Maybe on the back to the relationship thing Travis is talking about. You know, I, I have a relationship with my wife and I trust her to be faithful to me. Now sometimes it's based, she's right in the room with me. I'm, I'm, I see her right there. I know she's being faithful to me. Uh, okay, now is it more virtuous when she is out of town and I trust her at that point? Is that a more virtuous kind of uh, faith in my wife? Um, when you have less actual direct evidence? Possibly, but I think he's, when he's talking about belief in that case, it's not. It's more of a, an intellectual assent in that, in that particular context is what I'm talking but, about. But, but Thomas's really response was, was, my Lord and my God. Uh, it's a yeah. relational response. Right. It's, to, it's, it's all, but well, it's the story was so probably made up anyway to combat the ascetic tendencies to show that he wasn't real. I, I, I see it as an aside. The, I see it as an aside to the reader. I don't okay. think it's a believable but anyway. uh, actual history because you, Jesus wouldn't say that directly not. to Thomas about somebody who's not even there listening in. It's something the, re the writer wrote yeah, into right. the story. It seems clear. But, Travis, you seem to be concerned about those contradictions in the women. Not, a, not to mention that, but the tomb is open when the women come there in Mark, and it's open in front of them in Matthew. What do you, how do you, why would we have faith in something that is so problematic? So I think the response to alleged contradictions, and uh, I, I'm not saying we know everything, we can just solve these, no big, no big deal kind of thing. Um, I think we should grapple with these things. I think we should dig in, and they take patience. It's it's easy to just say, boom, these two details don't line up perfectly, therefore contradiction. That's that's not grappling with the text uh, seriously. I think my experience is for every one of these, when I have grappled with it seriously, uh, and you know, just like you can Google and find a whole list of, of alleged contradictions, you can Google it and find people who have tried to address them somewhere or another. Uh, and what they read to me is as independent testimonies, which are always going to differ in the details. And of course, the examples that have been given is the witnesses of the Titanic sinking. They had yeah, radically different things. But people, ne people never question whether or not the Titanic actually sank. Uh, so I think that These there's there are there are what appear to be contradictions. Uh, but I think you can, I think each of these... I don't have to say, like, when, when Jesus rose, when the two, two stories uh, conflict, that is the definition so what's of... what's an example? Well, no, I'll give you just example. described contradiction. Jesus, when he is resurrected, <laughs> says, stay in Galilee. Exactly. And then, uh, in another gospel, he says, no, I think it's in Luke. With Bethany and Mount Olivet. Stay, well, Galilee, stay in the Galilee, city. Beth, Jerusalem, Bethany, yeah. 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 Well, basically, one says Jerusalem, one says three. Galilee. Luke says, stay in Jerusalem. Until the power, until Pentecost, and that was the first night when he visited them. He he closed the door to any possibility of reconciliation of this as a discrepancy. There's so no way around. How do you answer that? Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to or have it in mind to of how to reconcile that. Though again, plenty of people have have given ways in which that could be reconciled. A lot of times it has to do with when uh, the command was given and, and so on. It was the first so, evening uh, of the resurrection. It says so, I don't know if anybody else has studied up on that. Yeah, I want to suggest we stay with the women for just more yeah. than three seconds, yeah. just because we're kind of hopping around from well, one to the other. Well, it's hopelessly contradictory. Uh, I well, say, if I say, you know, Bill was in the room, and I go, it was there, and they say, who else was there? Was anybody else there? Well, I just mentioned Bill. So that's the question. That's the typical Christian apologetic. Well, 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 there's a group of women there. Then isn't there one woman there? I mean, that's a bell. To me, to me okay. this was never an issue. The, yeah. the issue of Jesus being in Jerusalem, staying in Jerusalem, that is irreconcilable. That's the other one about the women, yeah, yeah, you could, you know, what a give or take it, whatever. Give or take it, you would. Whatever. It could be what you're saying. He just thought about that one woman. He was. He couldn't remember the names of the other women. I could give him that one. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. But it's not only that. In Matthew, Judas hangs himself. Uh, 
and uh, acts, he goes and falls and, and stumbles and his gut spill out. So we go, oh, I know. Uh, the rope broke and then he stumbles and falls. I mean, this is what well, causes us well, to lose faith in the too. evidence. The, the only thing that that would be a problem for, it seems to me, is inerrancy. Okay. The, these are periphery details of the thrust not, of the Not the appearance plan. of Jesus in Jerusalem versus Galilee. That's not peripheral. Why That's not? the other side of the country. If you had two witnesses, one that said that, that an event, a major event happened on one side of the country, and another yeah, side but I'm saying, on the like, what if I were to concede that? Okay, that let, that's mm -hmm. not my position. Well, let's say it's my position to mm -hmm. say that is a true and genuine error. Mm -hmm. I don't think it follows that Christianity is false. No, no. no now, I think what would be a big problem is if some a gospel said Jesus rose from the dead, and other gospels said that they sure. didn't. Now we've got a big problem right, right. if those, of course, aren't reconciled. But it calls into doubt the. It may call into doubt, down, and that's but fine, but testimony. generally what we're talking about and what we do in the book is we specifically say we're not talking about inerrancy. What we're talking about is the general reliability of the New Testament, and I think the general reliability stays because the same way, the, the testimonies of the witnesses of the Titanic, we don't say, sorry, we can't we can't understand uh, or take anything you say seriously because some of these you know details, and those are some major details, that were in conflict. That's all just the way testimony right after the so, fact. Owen had a place place yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Owen. Yeah. So, two observations. I, 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 I want to go in a different direction. Um, <laughs> I, I, you, you talk about the reliability of the narratives and you have four independent narratives. I, how can you say with a straight face that we have four independent narratives when oh. literally 70% of Mark word for word appears in Luke? Yeah, and he, is, he is obviously 100%. copying. We're not he saying 100%. He is obviously copying. Well, no, but uh, I'm word. not saying. Yeah, yeah. And, never really and, and, when, so and I'm not saying 100% four different. There's Emmanuel. There's Oprah. Yeah, yeah. There are unique elements. I have to remember that Luke's, Luke's gospel, he clearly, at the, at the yeah. introduction, says, I've carefully compared all the other accounts in writing this account for you. Right. I'm going to put together a more orderly account, he said. Yeah, right. And there's different ways of ordering. You, know, but you can when order he, it chronologically, and, and, you can order it uh, thematically. thematically. And, and when he is changing the story, he is not telling us who his original sources were, nor is he telling us why he's changing the story. When we look at Suetonius, when we look at Josephus, when we look at the Plinies, when we look at other historians of the period who are, conduct, who are writing historiographies or historical accounts, he is not living up to the standards of history that were in practice in other parts uh, uh, that's an overstatement. That's an overstatement because Suetonius and Tacticus and, and many of those were writing their histories with a political bent. They were serving Caesar and their. Oh, and they history. didn't have the disciples. Didn't have a theological. I'm, accent not, I'm just saying it, 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 okay. it's Similar. not. A, they were not absolute here, true historians. In this room, we always talk about the four Gospels as though these were like four college students were given the assignment to do a biography. <laughs> Put yourself in their shoes. Try to imagine where they were, when they wrote, why they wrote, and then along comes Luke. He wasn't even there. He wasn't an eyewitness, but he clearly went around and interviewed every eyewitness he could get his hands on to make his orderly account. So that we have the three, the three gospels, the three synoptic gospels, and then the the reporter's version, the doctor reporter's version. And I think that's and a we find and we find some discrepancies. I I don't even need the four gospels to be a Christian. I just need to know that Christ was resurrected from that grave. Is, is anyone you guys not remember we, 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 we had Gary Habermas with us via Skype, and he was addressing on the on the Anthony Blue book because he was instrumental in that, and he talked about the, the minimal facts approach of let's just talk about what's not under dispute. We can we can talk about was it one woman or three women at the tomb or something like that, but what is it? What is a, the minimal facts that you find in common across the board on that, and start start with those issues. So I think I so just starting with 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 crucified. I think I can agree with that. We know a lot about crucifixion <coughs> historically. So All right, <laughs> way so ahead of the people were crucified. But, but <laughs> so I, I I I happen to disagree. Very with generous of you, I, moment. I happen to disagree with Carrier. I, I like him. Smart well, John Dobbs says if there's anything but, historical, it's that Jesus was crucified. I I I I stop before we get to the empty tomb. I I throw up a I throw up a road sign, a, a stop sign when I hear pulled off the cross. There is really nothing from the history of the period that tells us it is more likely to be true than false. Absolutely, that Jesus Owen, would have been pulled off the cross Paul, at all. Paul never mentions the empty tomb. Am I right? 
He mentions the resurrection. He's, 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 he's our earliest. First Corinthians 15. He mentions well, the resurrection. I don't know how you have a resurrection with that in it. Well, well, but to the point, Paul never talks about a tomb at all. Right. I, the, the, so if, if we're just, we, we talk about the reliability of the gospel. Okay. But seriously, the, 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 the minimal, so what? The minimal fact. To churches. Let's start with the, the first minimal fact. I get past crucifixion and I go to tomb. Okay. For the tomb to be empty, he's got to be put in a tomb to start with. And, and I can't get there when I look at history. So you, you're asking me why can't you get there when you look at history? Because that's not how the Romans executed criminals. Yeah, but, yeah, but we have that archaeological that evidence that that's, that's not true. But, to say that but have we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of archaeological evidence well, about that. that we we do oh, have okay. in a ossuary the remains of a crucified man with the spike still going through his his, his no heel. He obviously was taken off the cross, and in typical Jewish burial fashion was put in an ossuary and um, the bone box. Where's and that? So, uh, yeah, where's that? that? Right. That's in archaeology. That we're is from 1960. So, 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 so you have an example. And it's from the first century. Oh, the yeah, time that economy is right, too. So, so I, I'll concede that you've got an example, but I think there's only one. How many do you need? The Romans. No, seriously. We know how the Romans do that. It's not a rare instance. You get the remains of the spike through the bones, and it's not going to be like every crucified person. Well, my point is that we know from the reason we have so much history from the Romans is they wrote stuff down. They kept really reading And we know from their own history, we know from their own accounts that that's not how they treated executed criminals. In general. The, in general. Well, how did, how did they kill but them? But you don't know in specific. Oh, and I think you're out left. Field. Field. No, no, I'm saying that they crucified them. What I'm saying is we don't we don't have any good historical basis for believing that it was likely, more likely than not, that Jesus was removed from the cross anyway, to start with. But your point, that's, that's my point. There's no, Paul doesn't mention an empty tomb. He doesn't mention the miracles of Jesus. So he what? doesn't seem to know well, anything about Jesus. Wait, wait, wait. You throw things out, but let's stop and think what you think. Would you call the resurrection a miracle? Let's start course, with that. Yeah. And Paul doesn't mention that. He yeah, does. of course he does. Well, then he mentions the miracles of Jesus. Yeah, but why doesn't he? Let's okay, okay, well, how about walking on the water and turning the water? Well, let's start with the big one. I mean, walking on water is nothing compared with rising from the dead. <laughs> if you're going to complain about miracles, complain about the big ones. But why can't you be like Rudolph Bolton who said, let's just throw all the miracles out and just leave the historical core? I think one could do that. I, I, that's not my view. Uh, and, and I think the issue with Paul too is that he's writing before the Gospels got sort of written and codified right. and established. So it's and I think he's also writing to people who are have these things right in their faces. So we don't take the time to mention these details that they would already know well. Perhaps I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. But I think there's lots of reasons why he maybe didn't mention And one of the things, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, and I don't want to be redundant, but I've got a lot of new people here. I, I, I don't really know. Uh, it's very frustrating to me. It's like it's a no-win situation because if the four Gospels, if, if, if Luke copies a lot from Mark, that's plagiarism. But then if Luke has something that's not in Mark, well, that's obviously fabrication. So it's like you can't win in this. We, what, you feel the same way. It's like Gap. Ken, well, your point? It, it's a minor technical point. Uh, I noticed that you can, or you uh, follow the traditional uh, um, understanding that, that Paul wrote before the Gospels. Uh, we've had a couple of authors in books we've read recently. Frank Turek, he, he was of the opinion, and also Jay Warner Wallace wrote the opinion that, um, that the Gospels preceded Paul, which is a very marginal, um, very uh, untested uh, opinion. What is your view on, on that yourself? Yeah, I, and I just, good question. I, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher, so this mm -hmm. isn't like me coming at it with, with uh, but my, I think I just go with what the is. Now, I do think that there was gospel material, oral tradition, or even written down. Uh, you know, because there were things that we know were, were before and Luke was looking at a variety of verses. And a lot of folks think that he was looking at the uh, earlier synoptics or whatever. Um, yeah, no, I think my view is that, with the mainstream view being that Paul, you know, probably in the mid, mid, mid to early. Thanks for that clarification. Sometimes uh, when authors like Turek or Wallace try to convince skeptics, us, you know, who are non-believers, yeah. 
to, to believe something on the basis of a view which within, even within Christianity is a marginal view, we first have to accept a marginal view first to be able to then accept their subsequent points. Then you're building on Convince, convince your own fellow believers yeah, yeah. that Paul well, wrote. I, I, I don't think that's what they're necessarily trying to do. Yeah. I think they. I think it was I, based on the. Well, you know, I'm saying they're not they're doing it just because. Of the mm -hmm. I think they're trying to look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. If you come to their own views, and I'm happy to have a variety. Of in the world. Uh, Jim, did you have a question? Yeah, five. Yeah, I got five. I've been saving up. Okay. Well, <laughs> the, 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 I think well, maybe please. one's a question. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't thank Travis Shepard for coming to this, so thank, oh, you, absolutely. thank you so much. Um, I think we're all over the place, so when we start uh, the second half of this, maybe we try to stay right on one topic. Right, really can. The iron thing, Owen, someone was talking about, I tend to side with the Christians on this because, A, there was a scarcity of iron for the nails um, that I bred. Um, we had that one evidence, which I know I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, and although the, the normal practice is to leave them on that crucifix for the crows to pick them apart, um, I think since that was a Friday night and Sabbath was coming, he was a Jew, off he comes, plausible. All right, third thing is we got five minutes, and second thing, Chris has a, a list of notes this long that he has not gotten to well, share. Well, go ahead, your second one. So, five minutes of Chris asked. Go ahead, Chris. Well, since we were talking about the, uh, the minimal facts approach, all my questions was about that, because in your book you, you note that uh, Christianity has a, a nice, tidy, single explanation for all three facts. And you, you state the claim that any counter explanation must also be a single explanation for all three facts. And I wasn't sure how that was justified. Since okay, that. so it's a point of, uh, and again, you guys have asked oh, awesome question. I appreciate being here and I appreciate all the questions. Uh, uh, and I don't mind me pressing, oh, I love this. So, um, let me just say what the, quickly what the minimal yeah. facts is, what, what we're talking about. So I didn't write that chapter, so I'm going to mention uh, that. Typically it's that the in a Roman crucifixion, uh, the empty tomb, uh, the um, post-mortem post ex appearances. Are, I, I, like, I typically say it as experiences. So there are some experiences, hallucinatory or whatever, but people were having these independent, you know, different people were having experiences, that kind of claim. And then the the beliefs of that the, the, the disciples genuinely came to believe that Jesus rose suddenly and sincerely, yeah, which we're yeah. not debating. Yeah, I'm, at least I'm not. Um, yeah, I'm there's a I have an explanation for facts. There's a virtue to the thesis that does it uh, without co complication, right? So the the more you have to sort of complicate the thesis, then that sort of Right, but if you just have a simple thesis that, let's say, like it's, it, and all I mean by that is that it explains all four of those, then that's a virtue of that thesis. But in reality, things are complicated sometimes. Right. Right. So yeah. if, like, and there's lots of complications with the resurrection <clears throat> thesis too. But that, with that thesis, you don't have to say it, it becomes more and more ad hoc. Is is the term that's typically used. 